Hello and welcome to International Dark Sky Week. I'm John Berentine, IDA's Director of Public Policy. Today is day four of International Dark Sky Week, which is a week-long celebration of the night that takes place each April during Global Astronomy Month. And today is also a special day because it is Earth Day and 2020 marks the 50th anniversary of this annual event. This year, because many of us are isolating at home, IDA has reached out to artists, uh, authors, creators, and influences of the Dark Sky Movement and asked them to contribute their work for us to come together in celebration of the night virtually this year. And we were really amazed by the response that we got and are excited to share with you the content that they have put together all during International Dark Sky Week. You may have seen some of our earlier videos, but if not, please take some time to check them out at idsw.darksky.org. You will also find Dark Sky Week activities you can do at home there. So please go have a look after the presentation. And before we begin, I would like to take a moment to recognize IDA's members and supporters who make this program and everything that we do to protect the night from light pollution possible. If you're one of those supporters, thank you. To learn more about becoming a member, please visit idsw.darksky.org. For Earth Day, we're bringing you a series of five presentations today that are all themed around the impact of light pollution on wildlife. And with that in mind, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Travis Longcore. Dr. Longcore is Associate Adjunct Professor at the University of California at Los Angeles Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, Science Director of the Urban Wildlands Group, which is a Los Angeles-based nonprofit conservation organization. And he is also an ecological design and independent environmental policy consultant. Travis is also a leading expert on the environmental and ecological effects of night lighting. And with Catherine Rich, he co-edited Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting, which is now widely viewed as a classic work in this field. And I can think of no one else in the world so thoroughly knowledgeable about the subject of his presentation today, which is lighting's impact on the animal world. So welcome, Travis. I think we're on friendly enough terms that I can call you that. Of course, you should. And before we get started, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested academically in the subject of light pollution's impact on biology? Um, sure. Well, I'm trained as a, as a geographer, and um, <clears throat> this is a topic that I actually got in because Catherine uh, started to pursue it in the, in the 90s as a, as a topic for uh, uh, grad school research. We were in grad school together, and uh, it, she got told it was too new and that it wasn't a thing and that you couldn't pursue it and whatnot. And but we we kind of got into it. And I'll go through in the presentation just a little bit of the history of how we got going and 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 made it happen. But uh, it's like anything, once you start looking at it, it becomes uh, endlessly fascinating. I grew up in a dark place uh, in, in rural Maine and, uh, and appreciated that and, and have always uh, felt an affinity uh, to that and the protection of the species that are living there. All right, thank you. And for everybody who is watching at home, please uh, queue up your comments and questions on our social media streams. And once Travis is done with his presentation, We'll have a few minutes afterward to do a little bit of question and answer. Uh, so without any further ado, Travis, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you begin your presentation. Great. Well, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. I see there's folks from around the world here uh, and I appreciate you staying up late, getting up early, cutting out of the middle of your Zoom, other meetings online uh, or your work to do this. So um, I want to talk about three things uh, today, a little bit of background uh, just to sort of see where we've come about learning about uh, light's impact on animals uh, and then I go over some of the mechanisms, the major ways that we see those impacts and talk a little bit about mitigation. Um, so to go back, you know, John mentioned that Catherine and I have been working on this for some time. We really started, it started coming together when uh, there was a proposal to light a bridge in uh, Los Angeles that would have shined like 14 Xenon Skytracker uh, bright uh, lights straight up into the sky. And uh, we got together as sort of a coalition of people to fight that. Um, and that included the International Dark Sky Association and uh, local astronomers and whatnot. We succeeded and uh, ended up with these sort of uh, mild tracer lights on the, on the bridge instead, which is what the neighbors wanted from the start anyway. 
anyway. But that was the sort of introduction to trying to get this topic into the public uh, policy realm. And it was the first time that a agency, at least that we knew in the United States, had declared that an impact to the, dark sky, the night sky was a significant environmental impact. But out of that, importantly, uh, we met this guy on the left there. That's Bob Gent, a former uh, head of the International Dark Sky Association. And he said to us, um, I'm trying to communicate to people that there's all these impacts to wildlife and animals from night lighting, but I'm getting pushback and it's hard for uh, me to communicate. Can you write a white paper that talks about how important this is? And we knew already that there were some things that had been done internationally um, about the effects of, of light on wildlife. Uh, there'd been this uh, conference in Germany in 2000. Uh, it came a little bit later. There's this work going on in Italy. Um, but we thought we can't really do better just sitting down to write something, but let's get everybody together and do a conference. People from all over the world who were working on the effects of light on wildlife uh, and, and plants, but hadn't met each other before and didn't know what was going on necessarily in the other sort of disciplines. And out of that came this conference called Ecological Consequences of Artificial Night Lighting in, in 2002 uh, at, at UCLA that, that we co-sponsored there and, 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 and ran. And that got a little bit of coverage. Uh, it was a great meeting. Um, the Science News covered it about the same time, uh, the, and a little bit moving on from there, the National Park Service was working on its, its night lighting uh, measurements. And so something that was basically impossible to find consolidated information on, we started to get it together. And out of that, uh, we published a paper in 2004 called Ecological Light Pollution. And then that book we co-edited with all those conference uh, participants came out in 2006. Uh, by, by means of saying, you know, that's... <laughs> Uh, the conference that we got started on that, you know, 2000 uh, with the bridge, uh, we're, we're 20 years in now. Um, and so we've, we've learned some things uh, during that time. Many of the things that we suspected back then have proven to be true. Um, and, and now the attention that this is getting internationally is just huge. Uh, there was this big op-ed from, from Kevin Gaston um, in, in, uh, in Nature uh, a couple of years back, um, cover story in The Scientist talking about ecological damage from lights. Um, studies of these incredible experiments that are going on with lights and wildlife uh, in Europe. Uh, there's several major research groups that are that are doing that. This was a story in again in Nature, uh, 2018. So we were maybe at the beginning. It was more speculative, and this was why Bob Jen said, can you do something about it? Uh, now we we know a lot more. Um, as they say, uh, if you don't know, now you know. Um, and the there's sort of, I've sort of consolidated all of the areas of light's impacts down into these five things. Uh, attraction and disorientation, so species that are attracted to light. Loss of connectivity, so breaking up the landscape with lights, how it, it does that. Interference with ecological interactions, so predator-prey relationships, um, pollinators, etc., and circadian rhythm disruptions uh, on the basic daily rhythms of, of organisms. And there could be more, but this is a good for us to, to talk about. Now, attraction is one of those things uh, that we've known for a very long time. Uh, moths to a flame. These are birds attracted to the Eddystone light here in this image. And then, of course, sea turtles that are attracted to their deaths uh, when they hatch uh, out of the beaches uh, on coastal areas that have uh, lighting. So this is pretty straightforward and we've seen it quite a bit. Uh, and there are lots of, uh, you know, it's most well known because it ends up with literally bodies on the ground, dead migratory birds, dead turtles, dead insects, um, etc. But then there's this connectivity issue. Uh, and I've been thinking about this a little bit recently because in Los Angeles, we have this mountain lion that lives in Griffith Park, a large uh, natural urban park, um, and is uh, adapted to uh, the night. And you look at those eyes, you see how big they are, how much they much, might be seeing. And so we've taken some, done some visualization to think about because there's research that shows that mountain lions will avoid uh, going to, into lighted areas uh, at night, going all the way back to the 90s with Paul Paul Byers' work. And, um, and so we took these pictures from the park that this mountain lion lives in. This is looking out over Hollywood, uh, literally. Um, and this might be how it looks to us as humans with our eyes adapted to the dark. You see 
see the bright city lights there. You see some spotlights over there in Hollywood, some sort of premiere. And what we did is we took longer and longer exposures to demonstrate what this might look like uh, to an organism, uh, a mountain lion, for example, but many other species that just have much more acute visual systems than humans do. So as we brighten this up um, through a longer exposure, we can start to imagine that uh, these, or these species that are adapted to the night and have visual systems for the night are seeing this uh, and not uh, something dark. And that's what this animal, P22, the puma 22, um, had to navigate across in order to get uh, to that park. Here's another spot along the route that, that, that he might have taken. Uh, here's another spot. So you just start to think about how transformed this landscape is and how those bright lights, when you're adapted to the dark, could be a barrier. And so we went ahead and, and created a, a visualization using some satellite data from a small uh, satellite that aerospace in here in Los Angeles has put up uh, that uh, tracks the lights and the lights are in the blues to the yellows. Griffith Park is up here in the upper right and the other parks are in a large area, the Santa Monica Mountains here in Los Angeles uh, that could be a habitat for this species. I'm hoping you're seeing my, my mouse there. And we tracked the darkest path across there and we can see and predict now how that animal might be moving across the landscape and if we lit these up even further how it might affect connectivity uh, inside of these wildlands. So this is what we talk, I talk about when we talk about uh, connectivity. And here is out in a remote area, this is out in the California desert, and that light there is it's a long exposure, um, is exclusively from the headlights of cars and trucks going on this grade uh, up uh, across a mountain pass. There's a bridge there right in the middle. Um, and when we walked into this site and got these images, uh, it, we found a, a big uh, mountain lion uh, uh, track there. So even though there's lights on the road, uh, that mountain lion is still using that underpass, but you can see how much darker that is uh, than, than we are there in Los Angeles. So e ecological interactions. Uh, this is a chart we put together for a paper I'm happy to share with, with anybody and have the IDA share it, um, showing the relationship between different levels of illumination and uh, interac interactions and behaviors that go on in species. And the, you can see the shapes of the animals, of frogs and snakes and, and fish and, and whatnot. Um, and, and just to, the point here is that light pollution uh, exceeds these critical thresholds for behaviors across almost all um, of these uh, wildlife groups. And so the, uh, you know, a full moon, we know already that uh, animals respond to the lunar cycles and the light of lunar cycles. Uh, and sky glow, uh, the scattering of light in the atmosphere or direct glare that, that interferes with that lunar cycle is also going to interfere with all these relationships. And there's some remarkable research that's been going on in this area around pollination and pollination networks um, around the world. Um, studies now um, are starting to integrate field lab and remote sensing. Remote sensing is using satellites um, or uh, airborne cameras of some sort uh, to measure. This is a study that was recently published out of Chicago, which is that uh, shape there on the left, that integrated a measurements of light on the ground, uh, use of a picture from the International Space Station to extrapolate that light over across Chicago, uh, a network of hundreds of wildlife cameras looking at the activity patterns of both nocturnal and diurnal species, daytime active and nighttime active species, um, and then going into the lab with, with mice and looking and seeing what are those illumination levels in the in the in the field were affecting behaviors in the in the lab and so we're starting to integrate all these things into studies like this um, and what this one showed from it was a really incredible study uh, showed that nighttime species are moving their activity patterns uh, later in areas that are brighter and diurnal species daytime species are moving their activities into the night somewhat in those areas that are brighter and we find these same patterns going on uh, in the, in the lab so really sort of an interesting and 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 shows us just how far now we've come uh, from just describing some of these problems or imagining that they existed from a uh, ecological theory perspective but to see that it's, it's actually happening happening. Uh, we're doing a study, we're sort of in the middle right now, uh, looking at light along the Southern California coast. Uh, the two maps um, are of the all of the points that we have uh, measured. 
uh, we call the sky quality camera, which is in the lower left, that gives you a whole image of the entire sky there on the right. There's software that we can extract from that, all the light coming in from all directions. Uh, and then we can look at the relationship between things like our predictions of light pollution at a global scale, this thing called the World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness, or Zenith Brightness, the brightness straight up, and then the total light that's coming in. And you can see the regression line there um, shows that as that uh, predicted level of light goes up, indeed what we measure on the, on the ground goes up, um, and, but there's also a lot of variation. Uh, a lot of movement around that line. And what that says is that uh, uh, there's a lot of small scale variation based on individual decisions, uh, in this instance on beaches, but everywhere that affect the environment that species are living in. Um, and, and those are things that can be mitigated and changed and, and, uh, and improved as we go forward. And so this this work has, is is in another phase now. I don't have the results yet, but we we have shown I can let you know and demonstrated that these light patterns on the beach are affecting the locations of uh, rare birds that are roosting, uh, an endangered species that we have here, as well as the spawning locations of this fish uh, that goes up onto the beach to spawn. Uh, and both of them are tracking very closely uh, to these light conditions that we measured along this along this line of coast. So that said. You know, we're now at least 20 years in on this as an integrated field. Um, and the research has been exploding uh, over the last, I would say, seven years has really been quite remarkable. And I just want to make the point, we now know enough to take action on mitigating these things. Uh, we can calculate the impacts of different lighting types. On the right side here, I have calculated the circadian impact of uh, different light types relative to high pressure sodium, uh, which is the orangish uh, light that's been the standard street light for in the United States at least for 60 years. Uh, and and uh, a lot of these names will make a whole lot of sense to you, but uh, high pressure sodium is right here. And most of the lights that are now being converted to for LEDs, like 3000 Kelvin, have two and a half times the circadian signal uh, in terms of human biological rhythms and other, um, just about every other organism that has a, a circadian rhythm has this same response. Um, Los Angeles LED, that's a, a, a bluer light. So these ones up here all have much more blue in there in the spectrum. D65 up here is a comparison to daylight, which if you think about the blue sky has a whole lot of blue in it. The ones that are similar, we do have uh, filtered lights, uh, th something called phosphor converted amber, which is a, uh, a yellow light. And, and uh, we, we do have these tools now available as LED technology, much more energy efficient comes on, on board. I'm just showing here on the left, these are all examples of lights that are designed to reduce that circadian impact. Um, and also coincidentally from our research shows that that also will reduce impact on most wildlife species combined with directionality, I'm going to get this in a second, combined with directionality, putting the light where it needs to go, uh, keeping the intensity low, dimming when lights aren't needed, turning lights off that can be turned off when you can, and then spectral control, so going to the more yellow lights as opposed to the more blue lights. And so these are all areas where there's biologists working on them in addition to the um, as the physicists, the astronomers and whatnot who are looking strictly from an astronomical perspective. Uh, biologists are looking at these issues around the world and investigating things like how effective is it to turn the lights off at 11 or turn them off at 12 relative to say bat activity or what's the threshold for impacts uh, for a particular species in terms of intensity or if we control direction or if we do spectral controls uh, and what are the trade-offs between them. So there's certainly lots more to learn, uh, but we have learned a whole lot in the last uh, 20 years and it's really uh, important now that we get the word out, uh, that we engage with uh, decision makers who are maybe in transportation, that we collaborate with people who are dealing with road safety to make sure that we get the safety we need um, while we are protecting not just just the sky above, but perhaps the frog that's in a wetland uh, that's down below. And so the big uh, difference here that we, we called out at the beginning was that ecological light pollution uh, is sort of a different and related thing from astronomical light pollution. And that 
simply pointing lights down doesn't necessarily deal with all your ecological issues. It helps, um, but you've got to make sure what they're pointed at as well. Um, and I just want to sort of shout out here that this is now a community where in 2002, we could get, you know, basically 20 scientists in a room and 50 participants and have almost um, probably half of the global population of people working on light pollution and wildlife uh, there. And now you could not do that again. This is, there are studies coming out every day um, uh, from research groups around the world uh, looking into these issues, coral reefs, you know, um, effects of this on disease transmission, uh, effects on, on um, you know, uh, endangered species, uh, intertidal, marine, just papers. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. And we have this information to put into everyone's hands to try to make better decisions about lighting. I will uh, leave that uh, slide up there. That's my email and my Twitter handle if you want to contact me that way or tag me on something. Um, and with that, um, I hope that was somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 15 minutes and, and, we, can, uh, and we can follow up with questions. All right, thank you, Travis, for that wonderful presentation. That, that's such a great introduction for people who are not familiar with this subject and kind of want to you know, learn a little bit more about it. Um, before we hand over to uh, questions from our social media streams, I have one for you um, that I'm kind of dying to know. And that is, what do you think is the greatest challenge or sort of unsolved research problem generally in this field right now? Um, well, I, I have to say, so this, there sort of, sort of could be two answers to this. The, you know, the, the one answer is the, the social science question, which is how do you get people to not use more light when it's cheaper? LEDs make everything cheaper. I drive around um, and, or they used to drive around at night. Um, <laughs> haven't recently. <laughs> and, um, and, and people are putting on bright lights using more than they used to, lighting up things more than they used to. And I think because it's being sold to them and it's inexpensive because LEDs are so much uh, less expensive. So that's the social science uh, question. On the science side, I think the, the trade-offs between changing spectrum and changing intensity because they're both really important. So the color of the light and the brightness of the light uh, and how we create a something that in, can incorporate both of those uh, at the same time um, and, and know those trade-offs for different species uh, and contexts is, is where I progress possible progress in un unanswered questions. And, um, it, but the thing is, you could ask the 20 other uh, people who've published papers in the last month on light pollution, they might have a different, um, you know, pressing, pressing, pressing uh, research question that, that we could learn a lot from. Mm -hmm. That's what impresses me about this field is that it is so interdisciplinary and it's bringing in um, so many researchers from different areas. Um, so let's take some questions that we're getting from social media. The first one that I have here is from Emma, who I believe is in Malaysia uh, and is up in the middle of the night to watch this, which is great. Um, she said that she did a survey in the Sabah region asking people needed a light in front of their house. And the feedback that she got was that light is needed to scare away animals at night. Um, this is a common belief among a lot of people. Do you have any evidence that bright light is scaring away wild animals? Um, so you said evidence and, uh, I am unaware <laughs> except, I mean, so, <laughs> right. If we're going to be technical here, we need, you know, that would be like data. Um, and I don't know anyone who has done that study. However, um, fires have been used for a very, very long time, uh, to keep animals away. We do have the options from Paul Beyer looking at juvenile cougar, cougar dispersal that they would avoid brightly lit areas um, or even lit areas. Um, and uh, far be it from me from my position to second guess someone who has animals that might harm them in their environment to do what they feel they need to do to be safe. Um, I think though you could do it um, uh, in a way that minimizes those impacts even if the the 
desired outcome of having an illuminated area is still there. You can still shield um, and 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 address those those issues. So it's a great question uh, to gather um, data on. I think what we find in uh, Los Angeles, uh, there are a bunch of coyotes that are uh, radio collared uh, in Los Angeles and living in some neighborhoods, um, not in wildlands, in neighborhoods, and have very few interactions with people, are trotting around under the street lights all night. Um, so the it may be that the benefits are not as great as one might imagine if you put up a, a wildlife camera underneath that light to see what actually goes by after everyone's safely protected by the light. That might be a, a, fun, a fun study to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Sandra uh, has a question from Facebook, and um, that is she would like to know about the evidence of artificial light on the song structure of birds. Um, so how is it impacting song structures, changing the frequency of their song, et cetera? Can you comment on that? Sure. Um, so there are some studies that have looked into this, uh, and it, it mostly they're around the timing of the dawn chorus. So when the birds sing in the morning, when they sort of get up and establish their territories, uh, under light polluted uh, conditions, that dawn chorus is earlier. So they have to sort of get up and do their thing earlier. Uh, and that's that's been well, well demonstrated. Uh, one of the early anecdotal anecdotal things that we had found in the literature was a paper on the song repertoire of the northern mockingbird, which if you live in North America is uh, it's in many neighborhoods and it, it takes on the sounds of car alarms and whatever's around it. It will mimic. It's a mimic species. And uh, people will complain uh, about them singing in the middle of the night. And when I was president of LA Auto Los Angeles Audubon Society, um, we'd get these contacts saying, what's this bird outside my window and why is it singing all night? And this paper had some insight on it. Basically what it said is that they will sing uh, at night uh, when they're looking for a mate. Uh, once they've found a mate, they will sing during the full moon and um, under artificial light. So, the fact, so you wanna hope that that male that's singing outside your window um, finds a mate and starts raising a family um, and then turn the lights off. Uh, because when it's light, they kind of uh, the, in, the interpretation is that they think uh, that they um, they think that they need to defend their territory, um, and full moonlight is enough for them to do that. Uh, so that sort of tells you the level of darkness that would be good to have them stop. Um, in terms of changing the song patterns, uh, the noise pollution is much more influential in changing actual sound of bird calls uh, and moving them around up or down in the spectrum uh, to avoid noise pollution. And noise and light pollution often go together, and those of us who reach their, this often work with each other. Um, and uh, But together, those two things do absolutely affect uh, what you're hearing outside. Mm -hmm. As usual, whenever I talk to you, I learn something that I didn't know before. And <laughs> I just I just learned that factoid about the noise pollution influence. Um, so that, see, it's it's worth showing up to these events because you never know what you're going to find out. You never know. All right. We have um, a pair of questions that are related both from YouTube, from Emily and from Brian that are asking about um, the uh, the importance of the color. You touched on the issue of the, the blue light content of more modern, especially LED lighting products relative to the old sodium standard. Uh, Emily asked how LED lights can be used in a way that minimizes the impact on wildlife. Um, and Brian's related question is about how important the spectral makeup is for a given lighting level. And I figured you mm -hmm. probably could comment on both. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So these are great questions. And um, Earlier on, I was a bit of an outsider in uh, the biology world because I was not sort of just universally opposed to LEDs. Because the reason people got in biology got upset about LEDs was the early LEDs that were economically viable were very blue heavy. Uh, and that was because of the technology. It was a blue LED with a phosphor on it uh, that then sort of radiated light over the rest of the spectrum. But there was this huge amount of blue. And so it was very um, sort of visually unappealing, very 
cold looking light um, and as a consequence it did a couple of things it uh, hit the the wavelengths of light that are most associated with um, suppression of, of uh, circadian rhythms in, in humans um, and it was affecting uh, many other species uh, that had a blue uh, sensitivity uh, including sea turtles and insects and and, and whatnot and so at the outset they get a really bad name but the thing is leds don't have to be just blue and and cold uh the technologies have moved we've we've frankly we've pushed them you know um and and now you can get uh warm colored or yellow or amber uh and you can deliver the light uh with an led that is more wildlife friendly of course the most wildlife friendly light is no light um but we can we can we can use spectrum to mitigate those impacts um and so that's the, and, and so spectrum makeup so if you look and just to, just to step back for everybody make sure we're all on the same page you know, um, visible light goes from the blue, which are very sh and violet, which are very short wavelengths, uh, to the red and yellow, which are very long wavelengths. And so we talk about keep it low means keep the to the um, the the light levels low and keep these uh, wavelengths low. Anyway, so that's where. All right. So there's a second part of that question. Did I get it yet? Uh, pretty much, it's about the the nature of the um, the spectral content or the color content of the light relative yeah. to its intensity, how those okay. interplay. Yeah. yeah, and we we specifically did a study to look at that at the same intensity. How does changing the color spectrum matter for different organisms and for human circadian rhythms? And the answer is it can differ up to you know six times um, at the same lighting level. So you can have you, depending on what color you choose, uh, what spectral content you choose, your light can be six times more harmful f for for a uh, um, for whatever thing you're looking at, whether it's insect attraction. Uh, and again, this has been known for a while. There's studies about insect attraction in lights going back into the 60s that, that quantified this. Uh, but now LEDs do provide the opportunity to tune and also filters on LEDs to get rid of the wavelengths we don't want while still taking advantage of the light that humans use to see. And that's sort of the key position problem that, that I've been working on. Uh, we don't net yet know the exact trade-offs, um, meaning uh, that I can't tell you yet how much you have to dim for how much change in spectrum. I'm working on that now for different things. Um, and the answer may be straightforward, but just I just don't know it yet. Uh, it, but if I had to fix one thing, it would be reducing intensity mm -hmm. um, spectrum comes after that because if you have you know a huge amount of light even if it's this a good spectrum that's going to have much much more impacts um, and so i i always keep intensity well direction intensity timing direct you know uh first uh and then spectrum is where we have to light uh, we have to light to certain levels, say street lights by by um, uh, by law or, or regulation or fear of lawsuits, whatever it might be, um, and then let's use that spectral tool. But you at home, you can do this by just buying the the warmest looking light you can for any outdoor use. They still sell bug lights, which are yellow lights, and that works. Um, and there are LED bug lights. So if I were going to put a new bulb outside. Um, I would go buy a, a, a yellow LED. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna have two more questions and then we will start to wrap up. Um, so Diane on Facebook asked about fireflies and she wanted to know at what sort of light threshold do we begin to see impacts on fireflies? Do you know right. anything about that? Yeah, I, I haven't memorized it, but there is there's some papers out of Brazil that show some of these thresholds and fireflies, uh, often there are multiple species in an area that that uh, specialize at different illumination levels, and they have different colors of light that they produce that contrast with the sort of dusk colors at those different illumination levels. So as you increase the artificial illumination, you start cutting off the 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 sort of niche, the environmental. Uh, portion of the night uh, that those species are are adapted to. And there are people who are really active on uh, fireflies, uh, uh, Sarah Owens, 
um, and uh, the she's at um, Tufts, uh, if I recall. Uh, and so you and Jim Lloyd at Florida is retired now, but um, there's really important uh, work that's been done on on fireflies. Mm -hmm. Very good. And for our last question, uh, this also comes from Facebook from Hina, who is, I believe, in India. Um, she asks whether all animals suffer from light pollution and experience similar behavioral changes. Great question, um, and thanks for tuning in. Um, the the short answer would be yes, um, except not every species. But diurnal species can be affected by having their nighttime rhythms disrupted in terms of the repair and recovery that goes on at night if they're exposed to light at night, uh, and have their activity patterns changed um, by extending them into the nighttime. Uh, and sometimes that might be quote unquote beneficial. So some invasive species take advantage of lighted situations, some of the geckos that are introduced to islands and whatnot from other places on the earth, they take advantage of lights uh, and use them to expand. Uh, nocturnal species all affected and uh, in one way or another, things that aren't are things that aren't, aren't exposed. As you think about it, uh, daily rhythms have been predictable uh, on this planet uh, up until the last couple of hundred years uh, for the whole 4.5 billion years of evolution. So every organism in an environment, even in, the, in places that have perpetual sun in the summer and perpetual night in the winter, they all have systems that are still adapted to these changing light environment. Um, and it's very difficult to find something where, where, you, where we either haven't documented something in a related species um, or don't see where the impact would come. Uh, and it's why this is a global issue. It's, why, it's also, I should mention, it's an easy thing in quotes to fix because there's no leftover pollution once you you know make the change but it's also the world's hardest problem because there's you know billions of individual decisions that go into the environment of is that light there where's that light um you know and so it it, it will take change massive changes in awareness um and and decision making and product uh, uh development and whatnot to get the right things in the right place so that we as humans can can live a little more uh, copacetically uh, with uh, the species around us and, and frankly, uh, help our own health as well. Well, that's a great place to end it. So um, thank you for that, Travis. We have a, a lot more questions that we're not able to get to right now on the live broadcast. Yeah. Um, where can people go to find out more yeah. about your work and what's the best way to contact you? Um, okay, so you can email me, uh, longcor at ucla.edu. Um, I'm on Twitter tra at Travis Longcore, all one word. And I have a website, um, travislongcore.net. Um, and there's a whole page on my light pollution research there uh, with all the, with links to the papers. Often they link to ResearchGate because they're not free. But if you sign up for ResearchGate account, you can, you can, you can uh, download them. But I'll always uh, share reference with people um, who email me and ask for them. Uh, and we try to get as much of it out into the public as possible. Great. Well, thank you again, Travis Longcore, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, thanks to all of you for attending the presentation today. We have many more presentations and activities still to come during International Dark Sky Week. So again, um, check idsw.darksky.org for what is coming up next. Uh, and the videos of this presentation and all the others that have uh, taken place this week are posted to our IDA YouTube channel as soon as they become available so uh, be sure to check there as well. So once again, um, thanks everybody. Try to get out and uh, enjoy the night, enjoy Earth Day, and we will see you here again for the next presentation.